December 29, 1906. Things went awry in the office in my absence. I'm not sure I understand what happened. I must untie the knots of feeling in me to see if I can uncover the truth of the situation. Upon my return to work this morning, I placed the jar of blackberry preserves I brought from Anushka's farm to, onto Mr. Soper's desk and cleared my throat for the speech I'd thought of on the train. Mr. Soper, I said, I just want to tell you that I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with you and I've always wanted to do something meaningful, meaningful and you have given me the chance to do so. This job gives me a direction in my life and I might not have otherwise had. While I was away, I missed the office and work and you, my employer. With There my words faltered. The way Mr. Soper averted his gaze made me feel uncouth. My gift and admission seemed to affect the chief oddly. He said, hmm, yes, well, thank you, but you weren't gone so long. I've spent many years alone. He grabbed some notes and began to read, completely dismissing my speech. I sat at the typer, typewriter, my face aflame. I excused myself and headed to the lavatory where I splashed a bit of water on my cheeks and loosened my shirt, ba shirt waist at the neck. When I returned, I began to wipe, type up the notes from the days I had missed. They were few and simple, and I saw that Mr. Soper had not gotten very much further in the case. Later in the day, Mr. Soper straightened his cuffs and began to put on his jacket, as if he were about to leave the office. He said, without meeting my eyes, I think I have found a person who could show me where Mary Mallon lives. I could not have seen... I could... I have not seen this in the notes, such an important occurrence. Still, not looking at me, he said, I caught sight of Mary while you were gone. She visited a place I want to return to this afternoon. I stood from my desk and quickly gathered up pencils and a folio. My pencils and folio. Prudence, I want you to stay here in the office to catch up on the work you missed, he said. I felt him strange and distant. Sir, I finished most of my work and I would have no trouble coming with you. He seemed to look at me as though he were evaluating my character. He sighed and tapped his desk. You may come, he said, but leave the folio in the office. I don't want to be obvious. We took a trolley north to 33rd Street, where we exited and walked east. My chief stepped outside the saloon, a beat-up front called Donovan's, with spittoons on the sidewalk, dank gaslights, and a loud laughter and music emanating from its doors. Something about the place frightened me. I looked at Mr. Soper for explanation. He glanced at me, and then he took a breath and said, "'You stay close to me at all times, Prudence. Don't touch anything and don't speak to anyone. Just stay near. Do you understand?' I swallowed the grip of fear in my throat, and we went in. The stink of coal hit me, and the food smell of food, sausage, pickle, sauerkraut, stew. On top of it all, the odor of bodies nearly made me choke. Every table was filled, a lunch crowd of gamblers and street walkers shoveling kraut, and links from the hot bins into their plates, swiggering from steins of brew. The clamor bewildered me. I recognized faces, cigar-smoking Officer O'Malley, for one, and Mr. Jackson, the smithy drunkards. The rest looked stale and ravenous, hedonist, with garish mouths in the careless way as a group as bad of those, bad as those who hang out at the poor man's retreat. Old Five Points gang members now gone decrepit. With all their ill-gotten money... They're worse than any of our neighborhood bums. I wished I had not agreed to go, but I wanted to find out our purpose. I held my breath and steadied myself and my hand with Mr. Soper's arm, and he led me through the boisterous crowd. Now pause here because there are three vocabulary words on this page in this chapter we in this paragraph we just finished. Hedonist, garish, and decrepit. See what you guessed. See how they look in context, and yep, you guessed it. Check and see what the real definition is to see if you're right. He stopped at the table at the very back, where sat an unshaven man with rummy eyes. The rummy looked at Mr. Soper and nodded. I moved behind the chief, fearful of the man, yet curious as Mr. Soper seemed to know him. My chief put several dollars on the table. Did you set up the meeting with Mary Mallon, he asked. A sick feeling sank in my stomach. The dirty rummy slid the dollars off the t table. I, he said. A bribe. I had just watched the chief bribe a man. I couldn't see Mr. Soper's face, but his shoulders curved down and his head low to the table, and for a moment he didn't seem any different from the bums around him. I looked left and right. What was I doing in this dank place? What were we doing there? We had our search. Why had our search for Mary come to this? Is this wrong? Is it improper? Is it immoral? I wanted to push the scene away, to deny that it was my honorable chief making such a lowly offering to such a dirty man. But there he was. 
Mary's coming home Wednesday night, the rummy gnarled, and Mr. Soper set out another few dollars. When should she come by? He asked. When should we come by? He asked. Aye, we'll set it up for eight. We'll be eating around eight. That man took the bills and sold out his girl, just like a piece of chicken. I followed Mr. Soper out of the saloon all the way back to our office, and I could not think of anything. I could think of nothing to say. He did not offer an explanation. He didn't even look at me. My mind rapidly tried to make excuses for him, but none seemed right. What he had done was simply beyond my comprehension, and suddenly he seemed unpredictable to me, even questionable, a stranger. He had acted alone in the time I had been gone, while making no notes in our common folio. I feel I don't know what happened in the office while I was away. I wonder if Mr. Soper has done this sort of thing before and has not kept record of it to protect himself, to hide. How can I work in an office with a man who does such things? How can I trust that he will not lead me astray in the same in some way? I wish I could speak to Marm about this, but the act has so shamed me I could not possibly do so. She would surely be upset. She might even want me to leave the job.